there is so many, especially in the days of yesteryear, uh, and in particular, artists of color. Mm -hmm. So many of them wrote these enormous hits. Yeah. They, they played multiple instruments. They produced incredible, timeless hits. But they weren't always compensated. They didn't always own their own masters. They didn't receive the royalties. Mm -hmm. I know you, uh, and I don't know if it's you solely or if it's you part of a larger group, but your family are now managing his catalog over the last few years or since his, his demise. Uh, yeah. What's that like? You know, do you guys have his catalog in order? Was he mm -hmm. able to receive all that he worked so hard for, especially in terms of so many of the hits that he created? Or was he one of so many of our legendary, iconic artists that were robbed for, for so much of their work? Yeah, both. The answer is both. But that was actually a, a, an issue and a situation that happened to him as a young man. He was younger. Um, my father, had, I, I, a brief story. My father was a very loyal guy. You know what I'm saying? Um, and he, at one point, was the the lion's share of the revenue for Stax Records. At one point, Stax had over 30 artists, but Isaac Hayes brought in 70% of the revenue. Wow. And Stax fell upon hard times. And so at this point, my father is a superstar. And rather than do what a business person would have done, which is um, say, hey, um, I need my royalties, which at that time were like $12 million in royalties in the 70s, which would be like almost 60 to $70 million today. Pull those royalties out of the company. It would have bankrupted Stax Records, right? Absolutely. But he didn't. He decided to, to allow them to delay paying him his royalties, which in turn made them, or gave them the opportunity to squander more money and file for bankruptcy owing my father $12 million. Um, that in turn set off a chain of events where he had to file for bankruptcy. And then in that process, he lost a lot of rights to his income for a long time, long period of time. Um, and so he missed out on a lot of money. My father didn't, my father at one point was, was never, never broke, you know what I'm saying, by far, but definitely to the point where he had to work, especially with the large family that he had. Um, he didn't have a lavish lifestyle. It wasn't like he was homeless, but I mean, you're talking about 30 to $40 million of income that he never saw wow. you know, over his life. Fortunately, um, you know, when, when I started managing the state in 2013, my dad passed in 2008, even in those five years, there were a lot of errors made by um, the people that were managing the estate at the time. One of them was his exec, one of the executors was his former attorney and they were just doing ridiculous things. You know, they were just, it was just stuff they did that that was irresponsible, like almost considering accepting cash for unreleased masters. Like, oh, they're these masters and you guys want to buy them, here's some cash that you can have. And I'm like, why would you, me knowing what sampling means in, in the universe, you know what I'm saying, of, of publishing and royalties. And so fortunately, you know, that never happened. But once I came in, the first thing that I did is had all of his, all of his work transferred from Iron Mountain from uh, Nashville to Iron Mountain here in Atlanta. I took out all the reels over a, a four year process and transferred all of them to Pro Tools. Once we did that archive and we discovered about, you know, he had about 400 unreleased masters, mostly instrumental stuff, but it was stuff that he recorded in the era of stacks, you know? Mm -hmm. So you're talking about multi-tracks with him and Skip Pitts and James Alexander and, 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 and Willie Hall. So the, you know, the core group of people there were all the musicians behind Shaft and Black Moses and Hot Buttered Soul and even some great records that were never released that we do have. And we're able to, you know, let people at this point license that music or even sample that music. We've had some success with artists sampling his records, like Division has sampled him, um, uh, Alessia Cara, Kodak Black, um, Beyonce sampled him on Lemonade, didn't we J. Had, Cole sample him at, at some point? I don't think I don't think we had we haven't had J. Cole sample him, but we've had um this new group that this new group called Brock Hampton. They actually have some unreleased 
master. So we did a deal with a company called Tracklib, which is a phenomenal company. It allows allows writers and producers to to sample without these huge um, fees and advances, right? That 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 the companies take, and it's based on fractional, you know, amounts of publishing that isn't great. But I mean, it can still be significant. The sample from Middle Child by J. Cole came off of Tracklib, and we're happy That's to. What be I was asking about. It. Yeah, so it's the same thing. You just go in there. It's multi-track stems. You can listen to it, download it, use it. There's some other artists that I can't talk about that have sampled because those projects aren't released yet. But we, I, I only put a small portion of, I probably put maybe 20 of the 400 up there um, just to test out. And we'll be adding more records um, soon. But I think it's very lucrative because it just opens it up that people have access to this music and to be able to create new derivative works and have, you know, masters and publishing for the family. And then um, through termination, we're starting to terminate his songwriting catalog. So those songs, you know, my father was a songwriter strictly from 1963 to about 1969 with him and David Porter. So they wrote some amazing records, you know, Hold On, I'm Coming, Soul Man, like those records are starting to come back now through copyright termination. So that's amazing. Cause, so they're returning to our family in full. Okay, you a, stop you know, there for one second. Stop there for one second. Can you elaborate on um, copyright termination? Yeah. So, so copyright law before 1978, um, the, the, the publishing of a song would, would remain in the control of the publisher for 56 years. Right. And that was just ridiculous. People were not getting their copyrights back in their lifetime. After 78, it shrunk down to 35 years. And now most publishing deals, the, the songs revert in a 10 year period, like a 10 year reversion. So if you write something, you'll get the publishing back 10 years from now. But you got to think about all these amazing classic songs from the 50s, the 60s, you know, early 70s that are still under this termination law. So that will continue to come back. But some of the, you know, his biggest records, like I said, is Hold On, I'm Coming. And that's coming back in. I think 2023 or 2024. So we just continue to collect. He had over 300 plus songs as just a songwriter alone. So that catalog will also be returning to the family. And we've already sent out terminations for everything up to 1969. So, and we're starting to move into now his professional career as a recording artist and terminate those records as well. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, how many of you guys are in control of his estate? We are a 12 member company. So we what what we did at Isaac Hayes Enterprises, and it was really my you know my my urgent suggestion to my family is that when a lot of these um, legacy estates um, get their their IP or control of the estate, it's run by a, a multitude of family members and people. Well, what, what tends to happen, as you know, is when you sample or license something, you have to have the permission of all the people in the family. And if someone has an issue with either lyrical content, religious freedom, they might not like the company, then it can also hold up business. So what I asked my family to do is let's just merge all of our beneficiary interests into one company called Isaac Hayes Enterprises. Um, at the time, we were going to find a manager to run that company. But given what had happened before with other people we left in charge, we felt it was more comfortable to leave somebody at the helm that put the family first, understood the music industry as I do. And so um, they decided to, to name me manager. And I've done that, you know, for the last eight years, uh, happily. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy to do that. And so that's a good thing, you know, that, that we have control and that there's only one person that they have to ask if they want to use you know, an image of Isaac Hayes or one of his songs or something like that, or his likeness in a commercial. So it's good to be able to make sure that we're doing the right thing for the family. Oh, that's beautiful. And it's, it really is beautiful that, um, you know, you you almost can't get two or three family members to agree or be in a business partnership together. Absolutely. You just it's, said the Ramones, The Ramones have had an issue for a long time. And sometimes if you ever wonder why you don't see more of a person in their music sampled or it's like why isn't there a lot of other artists out there it's because the families are fighting and that's unfortunate or somebody else is in control like somebody's gotten their hands on the estate that isn't a family member and they're fighting with the family and so um i wanted to be very protective of my father's legacy because we, i always felt he was taken advantage of and and i don't want him to be 
you know, uh, taken advantage of in death it, as he was in life. So we had to make sure that we we protect that. Yeah, I think I think it's great on your part. Um, as we know, especially with so many of these uh, iconic artists, uh, if you can get their affairs in or, in order um, and get their legacy right, that that yeah. that whole after death. Um, it, 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 it's worth their catalog and their imagery. It's worth so much more. We look at, you know, so many of the artists, whether it's my Michael Jackson's in the world, Elvis Presley's in the world. Like, th th these are multi-million dollar companies. Bob uh, Marley, some of the best. Bob Marley is one of the most successful, you know, legacy estates, you know, in the world. Michael Jackson's is massive, but when you think with Bob Marley, what they've been able to do, I mean, they pretty much own reggae culture and marijuana culture and coffee culture and things like that. And they've made it, they've, they've had an, an enormous amount of success. You know, any to be to be like the Bob Marley estate is what any legacy estate should aspire to be and what they've been able to do and handle their business. So absolutely. What's up guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.